Well, did you have a good day? Yeah. I'm a little bitter. We didn't win the Sandcastle contest. We didn't even get a participation prize. I'm like, what's going on with that? But that bear, the cross, that was amazing. Uh, the Grinch, not the Grinch, the uh, Cookie Oscar the Grouch. Sorry, that was amazing. They were all amazing. Fantastic day. And I am just honored. I, I love that we're here, that we're, uh, we want to look more like Jesus, and that we are putting ourselves and posturing ourselves before the Lord to let him form us into his image. Uh, grab your message notes. I called it your field guide. We're going to be in page seven here. I'm doing some one more night of pre-work before we jump into First Peter, laying a foundation. Really, this is an identity series. Um, I tell my daughters all the time, when you know who you are, you know what to do. When you know who you are, you know what to do. Or I tell the church, my church, when you know who you are, you know how to live. The central issue that we will battle our whole lives is living in the world, but not being of the world. And being our saturated in our minds with a heavenly identity. You are who God says you are. So um, we're going to jump into a kingdom identity. And tonight, I think, again, very timely for us. Um, as we think of especially our cultural moment with great division in our culture, I'll just say this multiple times tonight. I believe this to the core of my being. Uh, I mean, you cut me open, this is what I'll bleed. The hope for our divided culture is a united church. It is the hope. It is how the church grew from a fledgling group of people in the first century with no power, no buildings, no political power, no credibility, no really great resources. And yet in three centuries, they overtook the Roman Empire. I don't mean by, you know, politically overtook them, but Christianity was a force to be reckoned with in the best way possible. Uh, because there's a number of factors in that, but uh, the core factor of that was the unity of the church. Our culture is so divided, and sadly, the church uh, mirrors the culture in many ways around that. Not so with you, to quote the Bible. It will be different with us. The hope for a divided culture is a united church. No wonder the enemy is attacking and trying to have us mirror the culture and divide over really earthly preferences. We'll talk about that tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for this space. Thank you for creating this space. Uh, Lord, you know, nothing has caught you unaware. I don't even fully understand this, but I hold it to be true because your word says it, that before the foundations of the earth were set in place, you saw this week. You saw that we would gather at Cannon Beach. You saw that we would answer your call to come, to be together in community to meet in this building, to meet in Fireside, to meet down below Fireside, to dig into your word. Father, for millennia, your people have been doing just this under greater threats than COVID, frankly. Even right now in our world, so many meet under the threat of their very lives in death. And so we want to dig into the word because we want to be transformed. Please meet us here, we pray, in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right. You know, it had been a long five days. Come back with me eight years, and I was circumventing the globe on the greatest adventure of my life next to experiencing salvation in Christ and getting married. Uh, we had found out that the adoption papers had gone through, and I literally got a call from the embassy in Kinshasa that said, Mr. Gadini, uh, come get your daughter. And so we quickly got a plane to go around the world for me, and I was going through, stopping in Kinshasa, picking up JoJo, and continuing west to keep coming to California. Uh, she didn't speak any English. I knew about 20 words in Lingala, but we spoke love. And it's all we needed. And so we went from Kinshasa and landed in Istanbul, Turkey. Uh, and she was on my shoulders. She was three years old at the time. I had a roller board, and we were walking up to the United Airlines ticket counter because I was changing from a Turkish air flight to United Airlines flight. And the United counter was empty. And as we're rolling up, we're about five feet away from me to you. 
and the Turkish agent in a uh, high accent, Turkish accent English says, Mr. Gadini, we've been waiting for you. <laughs> and I'm looking at him and I roll up. I'm like, how did you know who I was? And he said, your passports, please. And I give him my American passport and I lay Jojo's Democratic Republic of Congo passport. And he holds them up and he says, this is how I knew who you were. He says, we couldn't figure this out. How do two nationalities have the same last name? How do a father and daughter come from two different countries? And at that point, I had to make a choice. I was either going to be the hero as an adopted parent of the story. And really, we, I know somewhere in this camp, there's other transracially adopted parents. It's, it's beautiful. The kids are the heroes. The kids are the heroes. And, um, we, you know, I'm not, Anne is not, there's nothing heroic about what we do, okay? Um, or I was going to go to my kingdom identity. This man, Amir, his interest had been piqued by something beyond natural. He hadn't seen this before. And he said, what's going on here? And I said, oh, Amir, we're adopting Jojo. Uh, this is my daughter from the Congo. And he said, tell me more. And I pulled out my next and really the most important document, my Bible. And I said, Amir, look at this. And I, I said, this is a Bible. I don't, I don't want to offend you, but I don't know your faith, but this plays into. And I, I read him from John 14, verse 18, which says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I said, Amir, I am a recipient of the love of God. I have been adopted in the, into the family of God, and God has opened up his family for me. We're just doing this for Jojo. So at that point, there's silence. And you would have thought I basically put a lemon in his mouth and said, hey, suck on this for a minute. <laughs> and he looked at me with a queried work look. And he reached down and handed me my ticket, still stayed silent, and said, here's your flight. Thank you. I thought I offended him. And we walked away for an eight-hour layover. And I was walking away, but in my heart, I was going, thank you, Jesus. Like, it's enough for me to be on this trip to receive my daughter. But here you open a door for me to spread the good news because I am a kingdom citizen before I'm anything. And that's not a reflection of me. That's God giving me the gift to let someone else know how much he loves them. Friends, every day, every day you and I have a choice. What citizenship, what identity are we going to wake up and live into? And every day, our culture will throw at us an earthly identity and where we fall short from the ideal, regardless of who you are, whether you have the perfect body shape or not, whether you have a full head of hair or not, whether you're the right color or not, whether you're the right profession or not. Every day, followers of Christ live in a world that bombards us like a tsunami with cultural messages of who we are, in this earth, where we place in a pecking order, and we have to fight for a kingdom identity. And the reality is our primary identity, you know this, is that we're citizens of the kingdom of God. And especially in this unprecedented moment in our history, that we're living in this cultural moment that's so divisive, we've got to hold on to this kingdom identity We've got to hold on to something greater than our earthly preferences that unite us. And friends, this has been the history of the church forever. I'm going to give you fresh manna. This just came to me today. If you have your Bibles, let's go on an adventure. Find the book of Galatians, okay? In the New Testament, the book of Galatians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Uh, as a young kid, before I was even a Christian, I memorized that as go eat popcorn. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, okay? Galatians chapter 3, uh, it's on page 1093 in my Bible, if that helps you at all. Um, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. I just want you to see how this kingdom identity unified the church amidst great diversity. Ours is not a unique cultural moment. You know this, I'm just reminding you tonight. Galatians 3, verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, uh, again, Paul is talking to people in the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, um, it was a very politically 
thick empire. You followed Caesar. He was your Lord, right? But then these churches popped up of these great diversity. And, and the Roman Empire took notice, like, what is going on here? How do these people get along so well? It was the love of Jesus and the strength of the Holy Spirit that did it. Galatians 3.26, so in Christ Jesus, you all are children of God through faith. For all of you have been baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ, right? Now look at this, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. That means in the church, there's no ethnic diversion, uh, division. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. In other words, there's no socio-political division in the church. There's neither male nor female. In other words, in the church, there's no uh, gender division in the church. There's no need for me too. And I want to really respect that. But in the church, because women aren't objectified in the church. They're honored and valued and liberated and empowered, just like Jesus did when he walked the earth. For you are all what? One in Christ Jesus. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Remember we talked about this last night in John 17? Jesus prayed, Lord, let them be one. Just as you and I are one so that the world would know that you sent me. It's an apologetic. And here's Paul saying it again. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Turn right for one book, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Whole different city. Paul's writing them. And he says this, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He's writing to a church that was filled with Gentiles. By the way, do you know what the Greek word, this was written in Greek New Testament for Gentile is? Ethnos. Ethnos. It's a word we get ethnic, ethnicity from. So he says, to those of you who were ethnos and were far away, he is our peace who's made the two groups, what church? One. Two, one, and it's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. The Apostle Paul is talking about the Jewish temple, which was created with walls. And you had the Holy of Holies, which was the holiest spot where, for the Jews, where the presence of God dwelt. And then you had walls separating where you had the court of the Gentiles. The ethnicities could come because God, even building his temple, wanted the whole world to know about him. But the Gentiles could only go so far, and there was a wall. And then Jewish uh, men and women could go farther. But then the women could only go so far, because there was a wall. And Jewish men could go farther. And Paul is picking up on that, and he's saying, you know what? In Christ, the walls have been obliterated. You are one. The hope for a divided culture is a united church is a United Church. Tony Dungy, who is a Super Bowl winning coach, he's a commentator, he played in the NFL. He said this, it's on your notes, the bottom of page seven, when uh, our cultural moment after George Floyd's murder and everything that took place and the protests are still going on, he wrote this, and he's an African-American man. He said, today we're a divided country. He's also a godly man. Uh, we are divided racially, we're divided politically, we're divided socio economically. Now listen to this. And Satan is laughing at the church because that's exactly what he wants. Division, mistrust, hatred, help keep his kingdom or help his kingdom flourish. Help his kingdom flourish. What is it that's going to cause us to be agents of unity? Jesus is so glad you've asked that question. Open to Luke 14. Meet me there. It'll be our primary text tonight. Luke 14, verse 25. Turn to page 8, and let's look at this. Luke 14. It's also in your field guide. Verse 25 to 27. Are you ready? All right. No one's ready. Tell me when you're ready. All right. Here we go. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and he said to them, by the way, it's really hard when we talk about follow Jesus. I identify myself as a follower of Jesus, right? It's really hard when we say, do you want to follow Jesus? But most time we, we talk about that while we're sitting down. When we read the crowd was following Jesus, he was actually going somewhere. 
and they were following where he went, okay? And I want you to know that's a key aspect of your kingdom identity. Jesus is always going before you. And like my experience with the mirror, and I could tell you story after story after story where things like this happen. And they don't happen because I'm special, or certainly don't happen because I'm a pastor. I am a knucklehead. But they happen because as I renew my mind and my kingdom identity, what does Ephesians 2 say? God creates divine appointments in advance, good works in advance that we walk in, Ephesians 2.10. Okay. And so when you're triggered or when you're, um, when you're tuned in to your kingdom identity, this can happen. Like I told you last night. Can you tell I'm excited about this? Like I told you last night, for the kingdom to advance, it's not going to happen just on Sunday in an hour. It's going to happen way more Monday through Friday in unexpected places, in unexpected ways, like a United Agents ticket counter with a Turkish man named Emir through ordinary people like you who are consumed with their kingdom identity, who are saying to Jesus, what do you have for me today? Where are the good works for me today? I'm open if you want to use me in any way, okay? So Luke 14, 25, a large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and he said to them, if you want to be my disciple... Now, we hear that word a lot, and you can fill this in your notes. What is a disciple? Here's the definition I live in. A disciple is someone who, you ready? It's real simple. I have to keep it simple because I'm a knucklehead. A disciple is someone who learns from Jesus how to live like Jesus. A disciple is someone who learns from Jesus how to live like Jesus. A disciple is not someone who attends church. That's not the clarifying, uh, the defining aspect of a disciple who memorizes scripture. That's a means to an end. I'm all for congregating as a church, but a disciple is someone who in the daily learns from Jesus how to live like Jesus. If you want to be my disciple, to to all, all play, Jesus is the most inclusive faith figure on the planet. Anyone can be included in this if they come on his terms. If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your love for me should be so ultimate that the love for others or your earthly preferences pale in comparison. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters. Yes, even, and this is the one for me, That's the hardest one. This is my point. If you ever pray for me, God ever puts me on your heart, pray for these next two words. Even your life. For me, it's my pride. See, I can't be a disciple and always want to be liked. I can't be a disciple and always be the person everyone turns to because I'm all that. Jesus is all that. And so he says, if you want to learn from me how to live like me, and by the way, Jesus was the most human human who ever lived, right? He was the freest human being who ever lived because he was never touched by sin. His love was freeing. His, his, his whole life, he had, he had the most purest joy. He was the most amazing man. And he said, I will teach you how to live into that kind of experience but you got to follow me. And this is the place where we put our three-pound brain to work and say, am I going to trust my three-pound brain or the ultimate eternal God of the universe on how to live? This God is saying to you and to me tonight, if you want to be free, if you want to be an agent of hope in this day, in this age, if it's true, that the hope for a divided culture is a united church, if you want to be a unifying agent, you must, by comparison, hate everything else in your life. Otherwise, he said, you can't be my disciples. He's not calling us to be haters. He's calling us to be ultimate lovers. You know, we see that word disciple, and it's kind of a foreign word to us because we're so used to being identified as Christians. But you do a simple um, word study, and you could do this too. I just opened up the Uversion app on my uh, my phone. A simple word study. You know how often the, the name or the word Christian is used in the New Testament? Three times. 
Three times. And two times, it's used by an outside group as a derogatory term towards the followers of Christ. You know how many times the word disciple is used? Who can guess that? It's open book test, everybody. <laughs> 250 times. Now you tell me, just on word usage alone, where is the Bible tilted towards our identity? Christian or disciple? Exponentially, right? Disciple. The word Savior, that's an important word. Thank God. Who is grateful for salvation in the room, right? Amen. That's used uh, 56 times in the New Testament. The word Lord, this is for the whole Bible. I'll give you a new number, right? In the New Testament alone, the word Lord, 2,108 times. So many times, and maybe why the church is mirroring the world is because the church is filled with too many people who find their identity as a Christian who's following a Savior as opposed to a disciple who's following the Lord. See, when Jesus is my Savior, I get to call the shots. It's back to last night, talking about uh, Jesus as a concept versus Jesus as an experience. Jesus has more weight in my life that displaces us. And kudos to whoever made the cross and had that displacement and the sand cross this morning. Good job on that. So what is the difference between a Christian and a disciple? By the way, uh, John Stott, old English scholar, a great man of God, he said this, we should not ask what's wrong with the world, for that diagnosis has already been given. Rather, we should ask what has happened to the salt and light. And what's happened to the salt and light, what I'm trying to say to you is our identity is all messed up. Listen, I thank God that I am a Christian. Christian means little Christ. Even the derogatory term, which first started in Acts 11 towards the church of Antioch, they look at those little Christ. That was, that was derogatory, but gosh, how awesome that we would be called Christ-like. I thank God for my salvation. But all of that is a means to following Jesus as his disciple and calling him my Lord. How do we do that? Here it comes, verse 27. You ready? Here's a secret. You know, so much of the Bible, it's simple, but it's not easy, okay? It needs supernatural strength. And everybody look right here. That's why we have grace. God's grace will meet us to have the strength. Here's what it says. And if you don't carry your own cross. Oh, wow. What? Really? Really, Jesus? Yeah, if you don't carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. And Jesus knew, and you know this too, in his day, they would see people carrying cross all the time. Execution was a Roman punishment meant to be punitive and to take someone as close to the point of death and leave them there as long as possible. But it was also meant to be preventative. It was done publicly, in the, not in the town square, but right outside in the main thoroughfares. We know that just from Jesus' story. And so when Jesus said that, there would be a big gulp going, really? No, really. See, in the kingdom of God, here's the key to unity. Dying is the new living. Dying is the new living. And it's not just dying a death. And I'm not talking about physical death. I'm talking about dying to yourself, dying to your preferences. It's dying a thousand deaths a day for the lordship of Jesus Christ and for the kingdom advancement. Are you saying that if I claim to be a disciple, I have to give my identity as a Jesus follower more priority than my identity as an employee or my identity as a student or even my identity as a husband or as a wife? You ready? Can I probe a little bit? Are you saying, Gary, that Jesus is teaching here that if I claim to be a disciple, I have to put kingdom allegiance over, you ready, my ethnic allegiance, over my political alliance, that I am a kingdom ambassador before I'm a Republican, before I'm a Democrat, before I'm a Libertarian? Are you saying that I should actually pray before I go into a voting booth? and ask Jesus, what does it mean to be a kingdom ambassador around this issue, around this cause, around this candidate? 
That is absolutely what I'm saying. I think that's absolutely what Jesus is saying. We saw it lived out in the church of Galatia and the church of Ephesus before we dove into this whole thing. See, friends, this is so important, right? And those are important. Thank God we live in a democracy. I'll say it again. I think this is the greatest country in the world. I really do. And I have dual citizenship. I'm, I'm an Italian citizen. I am an American citizen. I choose America, okay? But this isn't the ultimate. God has blessed America that we could bless the world. And I put our kingdom allegiance before my American citizenship by way of priority. That might mess with you, and we can talk outside behind masks if you want to talk about that some more. I'm just telling you as a pastor in 2016, not face-to-face but on social media, too many people in my church, and your church is way better than my church, I'm sure, put their American uh, political alliances before their kingdom of allegiance on social media. And you know where it talks about taming the tongue? I think we should call it tame the thumb because we are so quick to shoot off stuff and to use labels and to act so unchristian. Now, you would never do that, but in our posts, putting our earthly alliances first. So what is the kingdom of God? You keep talking about this kingdom allegiance. I want you to get this definition, right? It's on the top of page nine. The kingdom of God is wherever God is in charge. I love this definition. The kingdom of God... We have kingdom allegiance. It's where God gets his way. The kingdom of God is any place where God gets his way. It's this invisible realm where Jesus reigns. Now think about that for a minute. Just dream with me for a minute. Uh, this, This camp is a little slice of the kingdom of God. There's still a tainting of sin. That's why you're wearing a mask. And uh, there's disease in the air, pandemic. Not not in the air, don't freak out. Uh, But there's a pandemic, right? We still hurt. My daughter scraped her, her arm today. That's, that's evidence of sin, whatever, um, you know, that, that we get hurt. But this is a slice of the kingdom of God because God gets his way here. We live uh, in community here. What would your neighborhood like look like if God got his way? What would relationships that matter most look like if God got his way? I'm wanting to watch a four-minute video. Uh, comes out of Oregon, actually, out of Portland. It's called the Bible Project. And they do this, this great, great, quick teaching on what the kingdom of God is. And I want you to see this, and then we're going to wrap this thing up, okay? Look at this video right now. The Bay Area. Night two, Bible Project. We may not be watching the video. That's a great video, but we're not going to watch that one. Hang on one second. No, no, not important to tonight. So the kingdom of God where God gets its way. Maybe you should just stop. Maybe the Spirit of God wants us to do that. Where in your life, if you identify as a follower of Christ, and if you don't, let me just say, this is one of the reasons why I think it would be great to consider becoming a follower of Christ. Because where God gets his way, freedom reigns. Relationships flourish, people flourish, your perspective flourishes, hope flourishes, joy, peace flourishes when God gets his way. So what is it in your life where you want the kingdom of God to invade more? Is it your neighborhood? Is it in your own perspective on how you view yourself? Is it relationships that matter? Think for a minute. If we can't get that video, we'll just keep going on. God didn't want that video uh, here. But think for a second. We'll take a minute. Where in your life does God want to get his way? Think so? We got it? Okay. Watch this. There's this beautiful poem. It's in the book of Isaiah. The city of Jerusalem has just been destroyed by Babylon, a great kingdom in the north. And all of these Jewish people, they've been sent away into exile, but a few remained in the city. And they're left wondering, what just happened? Has our God abandoned us? Right, because Jerusalem was supposed to be the city where God 
would reign over the world to bring peace and blessing to everyone. Now, Isaiah had been saying that Jerusalem's destruction was a mess of Israel's own making. They had turned away from their God, become corrupt, and so their city and their temple were destroyed. Yeah, everything seems lost. But the poem goes on. There's a watchman on the city walls. And far out on the hills, we see a messenger, and he's running towards the city. He's running and he's shouting, good news. And Isaiah says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Beautiful feet? Yes. The feet are beautiful because they're carrying a beautiful message. What's the message? that despite Jerusalem's destruction, Israel's God still reigns as king, and that God himself is going to one day return to this city, take up his throne, and bring peace. And the watchmen sing for joy because of the good news that their God still reigns. Now, in the New Testament, we find this same phrase, the good news. It's the Greek word euangelion, and it's also sometimes translated with the word gospel. So when Christians say, do you believe the gospel, They mean, do you believe the news? But not just any news. In the Bible, this phrase is always about the announcement of the reign of a new king. And in the New Testament, the Gospels use this phrase to summarize all of Jesus' teachings. They say that he went about proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. So Jesus saw himself as the messenger, bringing the news that God reigns. Yes, but the way that he described God's reign, it surprised everybody. I mean, think, powerful, successful kingdom. It needs to be strong, able to impose its will, able to defeat its enemies. But Jesus said the greatest person in God's kingdom was the weakest, the one who loves and who serves the poor. And he said that you live under God's reign when you respond to evil by loving your enemies and forgiving them and seeking peace. This is an upside down kingdom. Now, Jesus also said that this kingdom was arriving with him. Yeah. So, for example, there's this really interesting story where there's a high ranking Roman officer and he comes to Jesus begging him to heal his servant. And he even calls Jesus his Lord, acknowledging that Jesus is his authority. Jesus praises this man for recognizing what no one else yet had, that not only was Jesus announcing God's kingdom, he was the king. And so the word gets out that this Jewish man from Galilee is talking and acting like he's the king of Israel. He's appointing 12 disciples, which are an image of Israel's 12 tribes. He's healing people forgiving people their sins. And all of this so threatened Israel's leaders that they finally decide to have him killed. And Jesus let them. Yeah, which is a weird thing to do if you're trying to become king. That's right. But for Jesus, this is what had to happen. Jesus saw the sin and the devastation of his people Israel as just one small part of the entire human condition. How all humanity has rebelled against God, resulting in the tragedy and devastation of our whole world. And so how is God going to bring his reign over such a world? Jesus believed it would be through an act of sacrificial love for his enemies. This is why in the Gospels, Jesus' crucifixion is depicted as his enthronement as the king of the Jews. Yeah, he receives a crown. He also receives a robe. He's exalted up, not onto a throne, but onto the cross. How beautiful are the feet that bring good news. And the good news now is that Jesus has defeated death and that he reigns as king, that he's dealt with our sin and corruption himself and that he's conquered it with his life and with his love. And then Jesus sends his followers to go out and keep announcing this good news of the upside down kingdom. And to invite everyone to give their allegiance to him, the king who defeated death with his love. It's good, isn't it? See, you look at the gospel Jesus preached, and I don't know what your understanding is of the gospel, the good news, but it was a gospel of a kingdom, of a king who conquered. It wasn't a gospel of just salvation. It is that, but it's so much more than that, my friends. Just a, just a, a quick understanding of his preaching. More than a hundred times, Jesus used the word, the kingdom of God. He was consumed by it. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, his first recorded sermon 
was this, Matthew 4, 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of the heavens has come near. In Matthew 4, 23, it says, Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues. What did you teach Jesus? Oh, simple message, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. A king has come. You can be under a new authority, and it's him. Every miracle Jesus performed, like it said in the video, was a demonstration of what will happen in this kingdom. It restored what was broken. His most famous sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, he mentions the kingdom of God 20 times in the Sermon on the Mount. And after his resurrection, the book of Acts says he spent 40 days on earth. Guess what his message was? Open book test. After his suffering, he presented himself and gave many convincing proofs he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about what? The kingdom of God. My friends, Jesus was consumed because he wanted us to be consumed too with his reign as king. Last verse, one more story, we close. It's why in Philippians 3.20, Philippians 3.20, Paul would say again to followers of Jesus in the Roman Empire, your citizenship is not in Rome, it's in heaven. And as you're consumed with that, as you wake up each day and say, be my king, as you receive the grace of God, his heart for you is one of compassion and mercy and grace. And say, Jesus, you've created good works for me today. I am going to die a thousand deaths to my earthly alliances so that my kingdom of allegiance can push forth your kingdom. Because he said in the book of Matthew, the kingdom of God, you ready? This is so cool. Is forcefully advancing whether you believe it or not. And friends, in America, it may seem like it's not. It is. But around the world, I was talking to someone about this today, in the southern hemisphere, in the east, the kingdom of God is growing like wildfire. Jesus said the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing and forceful people, not passive people, forceful people are taking hold of it. I want to be one of those because it's quite a ride. It's the kind of ride that makes a five-day journey around the globe to pick up your daughter be more than just picking up your daughter. It's advancing the kingdom in Istanbul at the United Airlines ticket counter. So eight hours later, we uh, go to our gate, and I give my tickets, and they ask for my passports, and I do, and I see a red light appear. And the ticket agent looks up, and in her broken English, she says, Mr. Gadini, you need to sit over here. And I fear is my signature sin, and so I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to make it. We're not, we're going to be stuck in Istanbul. I'm going to go to a Turkish prison the rest of my life. What did I do wrong? You know, I'm just sitting there. And um, the, the plane boards, now it's just me and Jojo. And I look down, and down the, the walkway, who do I see eight hours later? Amir. And he comes walking up and he said, Mr. Gadini, do you believe in angels? And I said, absolutely, I believe in angels. And he said, I think you might be one. (laughs) I said, my wife says that all the time. (laughs) He says, "Um," I was silent because I was so shocked by that Bible passage. Because I have been praying to God, if you're real, I want to believe in you, but I don't know who you are. Will you show me who you are? He says, I think you are an answer to my prayer. And he handed me a letter I still have to this day, which I won't go into. And he said, God bless you, and walked away. And the agent said, you can board the plane now. And I walked with Jojo in my arms, shaking my head, going, thank God, thank God that the kingdom's advancing and that you would take this trip just to let me in on the family business of letting your kingdom grow. Friends, that's true for all of us. We all qualify to do that. 
But it's not going to happen as long as we hold on to earthly preferences and earthly alliances. I'll say it one last time. The hope for a divided country is a united church. The key to united church are followers of Jesus who put kingdom allegiance before earthly alliance. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the good news. I pray for those who have yet to embrace you as their king. And you can do that right now. I don't want to miss this opportunity. Maybe God's working at your heart. It's a simple prayer of giving your life to Jesus, but it, it can be captured in one word if this is you. Yes. Yes, you came for me. Yes, I've made a mess of my life in rebellion towards you. Yes, what you did, what I saw in that video, what you did on the cross was taking the punishment I deserve. I believe that now. Yes, step into my life. And yes, save me. But yes, be my Lord. I want to be under new rulership tonight. Maybe tonight that's your prayer. Yes. And if you prayed that, yes, don't stay silent. We want to help you grow under the Lordship of Jesus Christ as his disciple. But Father, for us, we pray that we would continually be saying yes. Lord, that we would take up the crosses that you called us to take up and we'd follow you, that we'd be consumed with your Lordship. Forgive us, Lord, for just uh, thinking that is anything but a liberating experience. Holy Spirit, empower us now to be kingdom ambassadors. I pray for this camp that we would be the ones, uh, and I know you're stirring other hearts to do this, to be unifiers in your church so that we could be, as your followers, the hope of the world. The world sure needs hope right now. And Jesus, you're our only hope. So we pray this in your name. And everyone said, amen.